<laughs> Thanks, Amanda. All right, so we hit 10.50. You've all had five extra minutes for coffee. Um, hopefully that was enough. Uh, again, PDF's already posted if you want to follow along uh, on your laptop or uh, make a copy of that for later. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, Amanda just told me we don't have a session right after, so if we run over a couple minutes for questions, that will be okay, too. Uh, this talk is titled Drupal 8, Where Did the Code Go? Uh, from Info Hook to Plugin. And the broad idea behind this talk is I wanted to uh, really make uh, Drupal 8 feel a little bit more accessible for people coming uh, from Drupal 7. It might be trying to put, get their head around uh, where some of the familiar pieces of code in Drupal 7 went in Drupal 8. This is also a good talk if you're just interested in the Drupal 8 plugin system. Uh, but I'm gonna spend some time talking about a comparison between the code in Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. Uh, so if you've looked at Drupal 8, you might realize there's a lot of things that are gone. All these hooks, they're dead. Completely removed from the code base, you can't use them anymore. Um, so what do we do? We replace them uh, with plugins. Uh, so what I'm gonna talk about is really just give you a little bit of background about some, a couple key terms or changes in Drupal 8, just so you don't get lost when I keep talking about them over and over again. Uh, spend a little while uh, telling you what a plugin is, which is uh, uh, you know, an important thing that you get to wrap your head around the concept. Uh, then I'm gonna dive into a first example where showing you where the code in a Drupal 7 uh, info hook and corresponding implementation hooks went uh, in a plugin in Drupal 8. Uh, then start showing you some code for a little custom module and how you can implement plugins in a custom module. So we'll start with uh, putting a couple tabs on a page as local tasks. Uh, then get into a little more advanced examples where I'll show you uh, how you can define a custom block, uh, how you can define a custom text filter, uh, and finally a couple best practices if you want your module to define its own plugin type. Uh, so that's the roadmap for today's talk. Uh, this is me. Uh, hopefully I look like that picture. Um, I've been a Drupal core contributor since Drupal 5. I'm on the Drupal security team. I work for BioRaf now, which uh, makes a web application for software laboratory safety and compliance. Um, and I helped create some of the Drupal 8 plugins uh, that we're gonna be talking about. So in particular, uh, I helped write the uh, local tasks and a bunch of other menu related uh, plugins uh, that we're gonna talk about. So uh, we'll certainly be happy to take questions on any of those. And I also help organize uh, Drupal Camp New Jersey. So if you're in that area, I look for it uh, next winter. Uh, so this is the key Drupal 8 background, some things that uh, you need to know without which uh, you'll be lost, because I'll keep referencing them the rest of the talk. Uh, so the first thing is the dependency injection container, sometimes called the DIC, more commonly just the container or the service container. Uh, and this is a, an object that's available in Drupal 8, and it just contains instances of other objects. And each of these objects is a service. And what that means is you can grab that service, have it do some work for you, uh, and then let it go. And they're stateless. That means they don't change. You use them to do some unit of work, uh, but the service itself doesn't retain any state. So it has things like who's the current logged in user, uh, how do I take a uh, route and render it into a URL, uh, things like that, but when it's, the service is done, the service itself is not changed, it's stateless, uh, so that's important. Uh, we would be talking about uh, services a lot uh, in terms of how uh, you get and interact with plugins. Uh, the other thing uh, I'm gonna mention quite a few times is the new routing system in Drupal 8. Uh, so the key conceptual difference really between Drupal uh, seven and Drupal eight is that we now have route names and instead of using system paths. So the route name is just a machine name and that machine name is connected to a path and to callbacks to provide the page content, the title, all the things that a Drupal seven menu router would have given you. Uh, but again, we're using these machine names and so there's not a direct one-to-one -one correlation between the machine name and a path necessarily. Uh, finally, you'll see a lot of uh, full namespace class names in this talk. Uh, so if you're not familiar with namespacing, this is a feature that came in PHP 5.3. Uh, so it's been around a little while now. And what that means is a, a PHP class name can look like that full string on the bottom. So it's a Drupal search plugin block search block. And that entire string is the class name, but you see each of those backslashes uh, separates a section of that, of that class name is part of the namespace. And that gives you information about where that class lives and what it does. So you can see that obviously it's part of Drupal it's provided by the search module, it's a plugin, it's a block plugin, right? And then we get to the specific uh, actual plugin that it is. Uh, so this namespace is kind of like a little map uh, and is also really important for auto-loading, which is something I'll, I'll talk about later. 
Okay, so that's all the background. Uh, hopefully that's enough to get you through the rest of the talk. Uh, the big topic here is plugins, right? And plugins uh, encapsulate reusable functionality in a class and they implement one or more specific interfaces. And all three of those things are really important to wrap your head around for plugins. So they're reusable. We can have multiple plugins uh, and keep reusing them over and over again. We're not constrained to use it only once. Uh, it's all class-based. Uh, and what's really important is they use interfaces. Uh, and interfaces are something that make Drupal 8 actually much more powerful and much more malleable uh, than previous versions of Drupal because all these plugins, all the services I'm going to talk about in this talk use interfaces. What that means is if you don't like the way that the implementation works provided by Drupal core, provided by some other module, you can substitute your own implementation as long as it follows the same interface. And the interface just means essentially what classes does it have or what methods does the class have and what parameters do they take and what kind of return value do they give you. That's what the interface tells you. As long as your code implements the same interface, you can substitute your version for anything in Drupal core or contributed module. So that imagine it's essentially like swapping out the module file in Drupal 7 of, of some module when you want it to work a little bit differently. Uh, that's what you can do in Drupal 8. And so that's an extremely powerful new feature of Drupal 8 that makes it uh, more pluggable, more changeable that I think a lot of people don't yet uh, appreciate. Um, so a little diversion there on, on interfaces. Uh, so if you think about what a plugin does, again, it's a reusable functionality. Um, and it combines in Drupal 7 what was generally an info hook and a number of implementation hooks. So if you implemented hook search info in Drupal 7, this is probably not too common to implement, but if you wanted a custom search, uh, you're searching something that's not nodes or users, something custom, uh, you would have to also implement in your module hook search execute. Right? So there's the info hook that tells you that my module provides a search. Hook search execute actually does the work. Uh, and those two functions both had to be present, but they didn't necessarily have to be in the same place. They might not even be in the same file or next to each other. Uh, the documentation might not be clear if someone was reading your module that these two things were coupled together and essential that they both be present in order for your search system to work. Uh, similarly, a lot of you probably implemented a custom block, right? So you implement hook block info in your module. That tells Drupal about the list of blocks uh, that are available to be turned on. Uh, but of course, if you did that, you also had to implement hook block view which actually returned the render array for that custom block, right? If you only implemented hook block info, it was no good. Drupal thought there was a block and it had no way to render it. Um, similarly, you might implement hook block configure, hook block save um, in order to uh, capture configuration about your block. But these uh, different functions might not have been in the same file, again, might not be collocated, might not be documented as being connected to each other uh, in your module. So it was often hard to understand the code in Drupal 7, how these different hooks uh, actually work together uh, to make your custom block work. Um, so if you uh, dove pretty deep into Drupal 7, especially something like CTools and Views, you might have seen that those uh, modules in Drupal 7 had a plugin system. Uh, so what we have in Drupal 8, in a lot of ways, is kind of a, a, a grandchild, you might say, uh, evolved from uh, CTools and Views plugins in Drupal 7. Uh, but a lot of the mechanisms used to find those plugins and uh, create instances of them are completely different from Drupal 7. So there's a connection there, uh, but you really can't ha have a one-to-one. -one, you can't just copy over a Drupal 7 plugin and have it work in Drupal 8. Okay. So uh, how do I get an instance of a plugin? How do I do something with it? Um, so that's through plugin managers. So every plugin type, so like blocks, I have a plugin manager that's registered as a service in that service container that I mentioned earlier as an important background. Uh, so you basically say, uh, hey, service container, can I have the, the block manager? I'd like an instance of a block, uh, and the block plugin manager uh, will give you back the object uh, that knows how to render that custom block. Uh, so that's um, how we get to those through a manager. Uh, every plugin has an ID, uh, which may uh, generally be in its derivative, just a static string, and we'll see a lot of those in this talk as examples. Uh, but we can also have derivatives. Uh, so a derivative more commonly would look like a static string, a colon, and then a UUID. So that's a very common pattern for derivatives. And so that's uh, essentially there's a base definition and then a lot of unique uh, versions of that plugin. And I'll, I'll come back to those uh, later and give you a little more inf information about derivatives. Uh, but the thing you need to know is that for each plugin ID, which might just be a, a simple string, uh, that basically uh, corresponds to one-to-one -one mapping to a class. So I have a specific plugin ID, 
Every time I ask the plugin manager for a plugin with that ID, it's going to give me an instance of a specific class. Uh, as I mentioned before, you can actually go behind the scenes and replace, uh, substitute your preferred class for the class provided by Drupal Core or Module if you need to. Um, but again, once, once you've done that, the one plugin ID always maps to the same class. Finally, we want a plugin instance. We want something that's actually working. Um, and so we not e only need to know the class, we need to be able to instantiate the class. Um, and in general, a plugin instance, so the thing you actually use, is a combination of that class and then it is instantiated with specific configuration. Uh, and we'll get back to that a little more, but think about blocks. If you use drop blocks in Drupal 8, you know that you can take the same block and you can place it as many times as you want in your site in different regions, in different themes, right? So every one of those is the same plugin ID using the same class, but different configuration. So it's that combination of the plugin ID slash class and the configuration that gives you an actual useful block instance. Um, that, block, that configuration is off, often conf, uh, specified by a config entity. Uh, so just store that in your mind. We'll come back and, and talk about that a little bit more later. Okay. So I said uh, sort of an intro. Uh, this talk is a little bit designed uh, to be uh, reassuring for people coming from Drupal 7 uh, that they can understand the code in Drupal 8. Um, so you know the saying the drop is always moving means we kind of break things and rearrange things between versions of Drupal. Uh, but the message I have for you is that Drupal 8 and Drupal 7 still share you know, sort of the fundamental DNA, and a lot of the code is actually line to line the same, it's just moved to a different place. Uh, so that's why the uh, subtitle of the talk, Where Did the Code Go? This is uh, intended to give you some you know, sense of how the code moved from Drupal 7 and where it lives in Drupal 8 and how it works uh, in parallel to how it worked in Drupal 7. Okay, so the first uh, info hook conversion I want to talk about uh, is hook image toolkits. Uh, and you might be complaining that this does not have the word info in the hook name, sorry, but it is actually an info hook. Uh, info hooks just generally return to you an array of metadata. And you see here the metadata has a top level key of GD. So that's the image toolkit we, we want to use. We have a translated title, and then we have a dynamic, a key that's basically dynamically populated here with a method uh, that says whether or not uh, this image toolkit is available. So this is pretty uh, simple info hook, right? You, uh, if you've ever implemented something like that, um, you just return the metadata uh, and that's it. So in Drupal 8, uh, things end up working the same way essentially, but they're organized very differently. And so in Drupal 8, this is a class that implements an image toolkit. Uh, and you see above the class definition is the special code comment, which is an annotation. You see that at image toolkit and what Drupal Eight is actually doing is it parses these annotations out. So these annotations are not actually code comments in a pure sense. Uh, they're actually providing Drupal information about this class. And so they need to be formatted precisely. They need to use uh, the right keys and values uh, to tell Drupal what you want to do with this class. And so this at image toolkit annotation is parsed out. And the result of that is actually essentially the same as the info hook in Drupal 7. So what we get back out of parsing this annotation is an array. Uh, and you'll see the top level key is this ID GD. That's exactly the same as the top level key that we use in the Drupal 7 uh, return value from the info hook. And uh, we have again a translated title, which is uh, I think the same string as it was in Drupal 7. So the result of finding the plugins, this process called plugin discovery, uh, gives us an array of metadata that's essentially the same as the info hook return value uh, in Drupal 7. Uh, and again, you see we have a method here is available. Um, so this method is used then by the manager to do this sort of dynamic flagging uh, that we did in Drupal 7. Uh, so the plugins themselves can't give you this metadata back. We actually need the manager, right? So I told you every plugin type has a plugin manager. Plugin manager has a method uh, to pull back the list of available plugins. Um, this particular one, get available toolkits. Um, and it's a little different than other plugin managers because it's going ahead and is running this method on each image toolkit. This is available method. So just like in Drupal 7, we're dynamically setting the property saying, is this toolkit actually available in the version of PHP I'm running? In Drupal 8, we're doing exactly the same thing. Uh, we're checking if the image toolkit is available, and if it's available, we include it in the list. If it's not available, we leave it out of the list. So hopefully that gives you a little sense. Again, these, these two things work almost exactly the same. It's just the way we get to that information is a little bit different. 
Uh, so let's dive in a little more. So image toolkits aren't very useful if you can't actually work on images. So you have operations uh, that happen on images. Uh, so the image to saturate function is an example of this in Drupal 7. You see this function, we're passing in a standard class object. So that's a really boring uh, object. It just has some properties we set on it. Uh, it doesn't have any methods. It doesn't tell us anything special about what it does. Uh, and how do we actually uh, carry out a method on this uh, image? We call image toolkit invoke. So we delegate the actual work to the current image toolkit. Um, we're just passing the string saying desaturate. So here's the object. Here's the operation. Uh, image toolkit, please handle this for us. Uh, Drupal 8 uh, works actually in a very similar way. So we have uh, the plugin, uh, the image toolkit plugin that we need to call basically to have this desaturate op uh, operation happen. Uh, in Drupal 8, we've turned the relationship a little bit on its head. So instead of a standard class object, we have a proper object now. We have an image class, and the image class has methods, uh, has predefined properties, and so the image object essentially knows how to call desaturate on itself. So it has a desaturate method. Uh, you see that desaturate method that works basically the same as Drupal 7. It says, here's a string, operation desaturate. And I'm going to just pass that off to the image toolkit uh, that uh, is currently active and ask the image toolkit to actually do the operation of desaturate. So again, Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 working almost exactly the same way. It's just the organization of the code. Here, it's inside the image object. In Drupal 7, it was inside that image toolkit function. Uh, finally, uh, we go one level uh, deeper and want to look at how this image toolkit actually did that work. Uh, in Drupal 7, uh, for hooks and many things like these image toolkit operations, we had this process of building up a function name by prefixes. We'd say, hey, all right, so this is an image operation, so the first part of the function name must be image. It's the GD toolkit, so the second part of the function name must be GD, uh, and the operation desaturates, so that must be the third part of the function name, and if that function exists, I'm going to call it. Uh, and nothing would go wrong, right? That, did it, everyone ever have a case where you accidentally implemented a hook or something uh, just by accidentally naming it? Yeah, right? That was, uh, could be a little scary. Um, so again, right, like Drupal doesn't actually know that this function is going to exist ahead of time. It just builds up the name and, and sort of calls, hey, function exists, great, call it. Um, but you see inside there, it's pretty simple code. Uh, we're just checking if the PHP version we have supports this operation. If not, we log. Uh, a warning or a notice and return, uh, and then we call the function, built-in function on the resource uh, and say convert it to grayscale. Uh, Drupal 8, if we go this one level deeper, each individual operation is also a plugin. Uh, and as I talked about, your sort of ability to substitute things in Drupal 8, if you didn't like the way this particular operation worked on images, you wanted it to behave differently, you could substitute a different class for this specific operation, and none of the rest of Drupal would be any the wiser. It would call this your preferred class instead of the built-in one that comes with core. Um, so here you see this is again a plugin. We have a different annotation. We have an at image toolkit operation uh, annotation. Uh, an ID, we're told, is associated with the G toolkit and that it's going to do the desaturate operation. But you'll see that inside there, the code is essentially identical to the Drupal 7 code. So executing this desaturate op option, uh, we're again checking if the, exactly the same built-in function exists. If it doesn't exist, uh, we log a notice, and if it does exist, uh, we go ahead and we perform the grayscale operation on the related image resource. So again, what, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between what happened in Drupal 7, what's happening in Drupal 8, but the code went from those hooks, from those functions named based on prefixes, into these plugin classes. Um, so the code is still there, it still works the same way, it's still kind of Drupal, uh, but it went into these uh, class-based uh, plugins instead of being in functions. Okay, so you may be thinking, what about hooks? I remember hooks as being the most important thing in Drupal. And for good or ill, uh, hooks still have their place in Drupal 8. In fact, uh, there might even be more hooks in Drupal 8. Uh, and the reason for that is that every one of these plugin managers basically implements an alter hook. Uh, or provides an alter hook so that this is the way you in your module can go in and change what these plugin managers are doing, which classes they're using for a given plugin, or even which plugins are available in the system. Um, so this is, uh, if you're thinking about, you know, uh, how can I change the behavior of my site, I want to change the way one of these plugins 
uh, operates, uh, this alter hook would usually be the first place you'd want to look, and you could go in your module and just do a quick substitution, say, use my class instead of the built-in class uh, from Drupal core. Uh, so an example, hook block alter, this might be one you want to use, you're not quite happy with the way a core block works, uh, you want a subclass that changes its behavior, you could go in and in hook block alter, say, use my module's block instead of Drupal core's block, and that would happen. Um, so there's also hooks uh, that really weren't candidates for being converted to plugins. Uh, so there were info hooks that just returned a data array. Um, and they didn't have any associated code. They didn't have that implementation hook. Um, and so there was no reason that those would become plugins, because all they were was metadata. Uh, but you may find some of these hooks, uh, m probably most of them got removed also. And what happened to those? Instead of making them plugins, we just turned them into static YAML files. Uh, if people aren't familiar with YAML, this is a sort of fairly simple human-readable way to write a data file, basically to write, to write out arrays into a file uh, in a way that's safe uh, for Drupal to parse it back in. Um, so an example of this in Drupal 8 is hook permissions. If you remember hook permissions from Drupal 7, hook permissions just gave you back an array. It said, here's the permissions, here's what I call them in the admin UI, here's a flag that says if it's a dangerous admin permission, things like that, right? But there's no logic, there's no execute permission function, right? So in Drupal 8, permissions are actually stored in these YAML files associated with your module. Uh, so in Drupal just knows how to parse the YAML file into an array, so the end result is the same. In Drupal 7, you got an array of permissions. In Drupal 8, you get an array of permissions. It's just stored now in a file instead of being in PHP code. So there's a few other great hooks that we all love, like hook cron. Uh, that actually is still more or less the same in Drupal 8. Uh, things like hook entity access, if you want, want to mess around with access controls. Uh, some of these weren't converted because of lack of time, or some of them it's just still, uh, it's such a Drupal thing to, to change entity access that there wasn't a clear mapping and just some more object-oriented uh, strategy there. Okay, so I've mentioned uh, plugin discovery already. Plugin discovery is how the plugin manager gets the metadata about your plugins. Um, and I basically told you it's, it's the same, more or less, in the end result as invoking an info hook. You get an array of metadata, it tells you about the available plugins and some things about their definitions. Uh, in fact, if you wanted to, you could actually implement a plugin type that had an info hook as this discovery mechanism. I wouldn't recommend this. Uh, Drupal core doesn't do it except in a test to verify that it still works. Um, but you can think about it again. The result of plugin discovery is just an array of metadata. Um, and that gives you an array of plugin definitions. And that's just string, keys, and values. It's nothing exciting, uh, but it just tells you the basic information about um, things like plugin IDs, which class to use, uh, various things. Uh, the plugin process also fills in defaults. Uh, so every plugin wants to know its provider, which is the, the module that's defining that specific plugin. Um, and discovery can make derivatives. And um, so, Derivatives are a case of where you get many plugins, basically out of one uh, plugin definition. And so let me explain that a little more and then I won't uh, talk about it again. Uh, but an interesting example in Drupal core is the field UI local task. So field UI local task is a plugin and it wants to put a local task, uh, which is a tab usually in the UI, on every bundle of every entity so that I can manage the fields associated with every bundle of every entity. So if you think about that right away, you say, well, I can't know in advance which entities are gonna be defined in my system uh, and which bundles they're gonna be. So bundles uh, are the same basically as node types in Drupal 7, right? So I have different entity types, they have different bundles like node types. And for every single one of those, I need to define a tab uh, that's in the admin interface associated with that entity and its bundle so I can manage the fields associated with that entity and bundle. So derivatives are the way we handle that case. Uh, so that plugin knows how to query Drupal, find the list of all entity types and all bundles, and dynamically make a derivative plugin associated with each one of those entity types and entity bundles, and stick that tab on the associated admin page, and allow you to manage the fields. So this is basically where derivatives are useful. You have something in your system that's dynamic, something like entity types, the bundles, the available languages, for example, and I want to either define a tab or I want to create some available behavior associated with each one of those dynamic things. Uh, so I can have a derivative, I can query Drupal, find all those dynamic things, uh, and associate a plugin with each one of them. So that's it for derivatives. If people have questions at the end, we can talk more about them. Um, let me just uh, give you a little overview of uh, how plugin uh, discovery 
uh, works uh, most commonly in Drupal core. So you have two sort of broad uh, categories, I would say, which is the YAML-based discovery and then annotation-based discovery. And I showed you a couple examples already of uh, annotations. Uh, YAML-based uh, are for a bunch of these things that we pulled out of hook menu in Drupal 7. Uh, so we have the menu links, local tasks, local actions, contextual links. Uh, these are the things you most might most often use uh, YAML-based discovery in Drupal 8, which means you would basically just uh, author a YAML file in your modules directory and that would basically tell Drupal that there should be a plugin created uh, 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 with some uh, specific definition. And we'll go into those and show you what a local task uh, plugin implementation might look like. And uh, the reason we do that is that basically all of these things, all the, the local tasks, more or less, or 95% of them, use the same class behind the scene. Um, in contrast, uh, most of the plugin systems in Drupal core use annotation. So a couple of these, one I showed you already, the image toolkit, uh, which uses annotation uh, and maybe some configuration, uh, but doesn't have a config entity. Uh, then the vast, vast majority of plugins in Drupal 8 use a combination of an annotation-based plugin, uh, discovery system, and a config entity uh, in order to combine those things together and give you a specific plugin instance. Um, so things like blocks, which I've referenced a bunch of times, we'll talk about more. Uh, views, all the views plugins, so like a views display, image effects, uh, searches if you want to define a search. Uh, so those all th use a combination of uh, annotation and a config entity. Uh, finally, just a little warning, if you want to go look at the code uh, and figure out how plugins work, uh, the entity system in Drupal more or less works like a plugin. It has annotations, uh, but there's so many things layered on top of the entity system, you sh should not try to use the entity system to understand the plugin system. So start with a much simpler plugin system, even like the block system, which is a little bit complex, uh, is much easier to understand than the entity system. So focus on one of these other ones if you want to understand how plugins work. Uh, the entity system obviously is great for a lot of things, but, but it's just not an easy example to dive into uh, first thing. Okay, so um, as I said at the beginning, we're gonna look at a little code. I'm gonna show you how you can implement in a module uh, some of these plugins. Uh, so the, we're gonna get started with the Drupal 8 plugin toolkit. Uh, so you need a module. Uh, you're gonna write your own module in Drupal 8. Um, all you need uh, to define a module in Drupal 8 is a .info.yml file, which is a YAML file. As I said, YAML is all over Drupal 8. Um, so you don't even need an empty module file. In Drupal 7, you needed at least a .module file to exist in the file system. In Drupal 8, you don't even need that. You could just write this one YAML file and Drupal will recognize your module and allow you to enable it. Um, the reason for that is that most of the module code is now in classes. It's not in the .module file. So it's perfectly fine for there not to be a module, .module file because all you might have in there would be a few hooks anyway. Um, the other thing uh, that's fun to note about Drupal 8 is the code, uh, code base was reorganized and if you ever uh, developed a site and handed it over to someone in Drupal 7, you had to keep telling them over and over again, don't put modules in the modules directory. That would make sense but don't do it. <laughs> you have to put it in sites all modules, something, right? Uh, Drupal 8 is different. Drupal 8, you can actually put all your modules directly in the modules directory. All the core modules now live under the core directory under core modules. So uh, people, you don't see them, it's under the core directory, uh, and you can actually go ahead now and put all of your custom modules or your contributed modules under the top levels modules, modules directory. It's a lot easier to find and manage them. Um, so here's uh, what uh, basically, all you would need to write uh, to uh, enable a custom module, have it appear in the UI and turn it on. Uh, all the code I'm showing you is in a sandbox. I'll give you a link at the end if you want to clone that sandbox and look at the code yourself. Uh, turn it on in a Drupal 8 site, uh, play with it. Um, so the, the .info.yaml uh, file contents looks basically the same as a .info file in Drupal 7. It tells you the name, tells you this is a module. Options there are basically module, profile, and theme for the type description, and of course that it's a Drupal 8 module. Um, so once we've done that, we can start um, adding some plugins to our module. Uh, so I'm gonna add two local tasks. Local task tabs, I don't know what term people prefer. Um, so in order to do that, all I have to do is write a YAML file. I just have to follow this naming pattern, my module links.tasks.yml. Um, in that file, it's a very simple format. Um, the top level key is the plugin ID. So I talked about plugin IDs. A plugin ID is gonna to map to a class that's gonna uh, provide the functionality. Um, 
route name. So I told you a route name is a machine name. It basically tells you how this tab uh, is going to have a link rendered to appear on the tab. So the link is going to link to that route name, wherever that goes. Uh, the title, and then a base route. And so this is new in Drupal 8. Uh, when we rewrote this local task system, uh, I was really sick of this uh, default local task thing that you used to have to do in Drupal 7. Uh, jump through hoops to make two tabs appear together. So in Drupal 8, basically this is all you have to do. Uh, you just tell it, okay, this base route is sort of the grouping principle. All my tabs are going to appear together there. And the one, the first one you see, that route is its, the route that it's linked to. So that's going to be the default tab. So the default tab is the one that links to the base route. All the other tabs are going to be the secondary tabs associated with it. So hopefully this uh, makes for a little uh, easier developer experience, uh, easier to wrap your head around. Uh, so I put this on my module. I turn it on. Uh, you may have to clear cache if you write a new file, of course, because the plugin managers cache the definitions they found before. Um, but once I do that, I get two tabs uh, appearing on the page. And you'll see the right tab, uh, the right-hand screenshot is the default tab, the list tab. Um, and that has path admin config my module list. Uh, the screenshot behind on the left is the secondary tab, has path admin config also my module settings. So what have I done here? Uh, if you remember, we were using route names. Route names use our machine names. So Drupal no longer cares about the two paths. I can put these two tabs right next to each other in the admin page, even though their paths are not hierarchically related in any way. So this is a uh, cute little feature of Drupal 8. Uh, hopefully uh, makes it easier to build admin interfaces because you no longer have to jump through hoops aligning the paths where your pages appear in order to have a group of tabs of related to functionality. OK, and you see uh, I printed some output on these two pages. And now you may be wondering, wait a minute, I think he just skipped a step because he pointed to some routes and he didn't tell us about the routes. So yes, all right, I skipped a step. So we back up, we also need to define the two routes. Uh, so these are custom routes in the module. Again, if you pull down the code, you can look at these. Um, so the most common way in Drupal 8 to define routes is, again, a YAML file. Um, uh, so again, if you're not familiar with YAML files, please uh, read up on them. Um, so this looks very similar to the plugin uh, definitions, but it's a routing definition. And most of the uh, keys in here are actually taken from the Symfony uh, routing system, so you can actually find, discover most of the things that are going on here by looking at the Symfony documentation. Um, and again, it's pretty simple. The top level key is the route name. You see module.list or module.settings. Those are the two route names. There's a path. Uh, where does this uh, route actually go? What path uh, is connected to this route? And then the controller, which is essentially the page callback. And uh, these two uh, controllers I defined are stupidly simple. I'm not even going to show you the code. It basically just prints out the class name and method. Uh, it's, in the, it's in the example code. Uh, a title and then access check, which is just true. So anyone can access these two pages. Um, so this is how you define a route in your module. And then when we have these routes defined, again, we, then we can use them for things like our local tasks uh, linked to them. Or we can use them in the block, you'll see later, linking to them from our block. OK, great. So hopefully that's. Um, moving us forward, but you may, you may be wondering, OK, I saw you wrote those two YAML files to define the plugins, but how the hell do I know what valid keys can go in those YAML files and what do they mean? Um, and so that's a, something you have to dig in a little bit. And um, we've put those, that information on in the plugin managers. So the YAML files aren't really self-documenting uh, the way that you'll see that uh, class annotations can be. Uh, but the, in the plugin managers you see here is the list of all the valid keys if you're defining a local task or a tab. Uh, so some of them you already saw, like the route name. Uh, the route parameters uh, goes along with the route name, and that's things like a node ID. So if you wanted to link to a specific node, that would be a route parameter. Um, title, the base route I told you about is where they're grouped. A parent ID allows you to have a hierarchy of, of tasks, of tabs. So if you remember making secondary tabs based, again, on a convoluted system of paths in previous versions of Drupal, now all you have to say is, this particular plugin, I want to be underneath it. Um, and that works uh, with that parent ID, the weight, the options for rendering the URL, and again, the class. So if you uh, want to have a specific class rather than the default class, uh, you can provide that in your plugin definition. OK. Um, so that was a pretty simple example in a way. All I had to do was essentially define some routes or use some existing routes, uh, and then write a YAML file to get two tabs to appear which are basically implementing plugins in my module. Uh, so we're, now we're going to go into blocks. And this is 
I think a really common use case, one of the first things people might do in a custom module is say, I want to block, uh, exposes a widget, it gives me a list of something on the site custom, um, and hopefully you will like the new block in Drupal 8 compared to Drupal 7. Uh, again, blocks are plugins now. So every custom block is its own class. It's completely encapsulated, it lives separate from every other block. Um, when you as the administrator uh, go to the back end, and I'll show you some screenshots of this, to place a block. So you're placing a block in a region, in a theme, uh, with a specific weight. Um, a configuration object is created to track that setting. So now we know there's a specific instance of this block in a specific region, in a specific theme. Uh, that config object uh, that's created is a config entity, uh, which I've mentioned several times now, and we'll, so we'll pause to actually tell you what that is. So config entity uh, is an abstraction on top of the configuration management initiative. So if people remember the configuration management initiative was a big thing uh, in Drupal 8, and that basically lets you export or import the configuration of your Drupal site as YAML files. Um, again, YAML. Uh, so, um, or also view them as YAML files. Uh, so what this config entity abstraction does is let you treat essentially that data object that's represented as a YAML file as an entity. So something that essentially shares a bunch of methods uh, with things like nodes. And that means it's very e easy for Drupal now to have an API that allows you to easily find, list, and load uh, these configuration objects using the same basic API as you would to find, list, or load something like nodes. Uh, so that's why this abstraction is useful. So now Drupal can more easily just say, hey, I want to uh, do a query and find all the list of active block instances corresponding, which are basically these configuration entities. Um, and so that just works now much more naturally in the API. Uh, in the example I'll show you, uh, if you're writing just a basic block, you don't have to worry about this. So we're going to extend uh, a base class that Drupal 8 gives us. Uh, Drupal 8's already going to take care of all the work of saving this configuration entity for us if we use that base class. So you don't have to worry about it all in the example I'm going to show you. Uh, but you know, in the back of your mind, if you want to add your own uh, specific configuration for your block, you're going to have to add a little bit uh, more code to add those settings uh, to the configuration entity that's saved along with your block. Okay. So. Uh, how do we implement a block? Uh, we're going to implement the Drupal core block block plugin interface. Remember I told you about interfaces. Interfaces are very important because it lets us substitute our, or uh, reuse uh, code. So any block has to implement the block interface, block plugin interface, and any block essentially could be substituted for a different block as long as you're both implementing this interface. Um, if you extend this abstract class that Drupal core provides, the, the Drupal core block block base class, all you need to do is implement one method, which is the build method, which is the same as hook block view in Drupal 7. So hook block view, you return a render array. Drupal 8, the build method, return a render array. That will be rendered for your block. You're done. It's very simple to implement a couple, custom block in Drupal 8. Uh, so for this example module, I added uh, Drupal my module plugin block my block. Um, and a quick side note, uh, people may be wondering again why this namespace is so important, why I need to use this very uh, long naming for classes, and that's because of the way that auto-loading works. Uh, so we're using the PSR4 auto-loading standard, uh, and what that means is that when I add, when I want to add a block with this kind of name to my module, uh, there's a one-to-one -one mapping of where that lives in terms of the file system. Uh, so it's at the path under modules, my module, SRC, uh, then plugin block, my block.php. And if you look at that, you can see very clearly the mapping. Of course, this is Drupal. It's a module. Uh, it's under my module. So that's the first two parts of the namespace. Uh, then plugin block my block are the last three parts of the namespace. If you basically take those backslashes, you flip them to forward slashes, that defines the file path under that SRC directory. Right? So I'm going to create a, a class in a specific namespace. I have to create the corresponding directory under my module, under its SRC directory, uh, and put the, the class file there. And then Autoloading works like magic. Uh, the autoloader knows how to scan the file system. If I ask for a class of that name, it knows exactly which directory to find it in. OK. So what does a block plugin class look like? Uh, this is basically, I cut a couple extraneous lines, but this is essentially all there is to it. If you want to write a custom block, it could be this simple. Uh, you see this is annotated again. It's an at block annotation. Uh, it tells you the plugin ID and gives you a label that's going to show up in the administrative interface. Uh, which I will show you in a second, a screenshot of. And then it just returns a render array. The render array has two links. They link to those two routes I defined in my module. Uh, so 
bringing it together here, you know, so I've defined the routes, define a block, the block has two links that point to the routes, uh, which have those two tabs. Uh, so hopefully, if, if you're trying to get started, that example code might be useful. Um, so if I define this class, maybe clear the caches so that the plugin manager finds it, um, then I can create an instance of this block. If you haven't used the Drupal 8 blocks admin page yet, um, it's uh, got a new functionality called place block. If you remember Drupal 7, it told you available blocks. In Drupal 8, we're gonna place a new block, and we can do that as many times as we want with the same block. So we can have as many instances as we want of the same block. So I click place block, I do a search here, I find my module block, that was the string that was in the annotation as the admin label. Um, click place block again, um, and then I get a configuration page. It looks pretty similar to a Drupal 7 uh, block configuration page. Uh, and if I click here, I've gone ahead and created a new plugin instance. I've created an instance of that block. Uh, so there's a configuration saying uh, this block exists in this region, in this theme, with these settings. Um, and so when I now go to my front page, uh, that block will be rendered. You see there on the left, it's rendered, has two links uh, that came from that render array in the build method, and it shows up on the page. So that's all there is to it. Uh, block plugins, again, in conceptually uh, doing the same things as Drupal 7, uh, but that code has all moved into the block plugin class instead of being uh, present in hooks. And just to, to make that a little more clear, uh, let's just do, again, a one-to-one -one comparison so you can see how this code is moving from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. At Drupal 7, we had hook block info, right? And that just returned an array listing the blocks your module provided. Uh, in Drupal 8, that's handled by the block plugin manager. Block plugin manager knows how to get all the metadata from the annotations and basically builds up an array of all the available block plugins. Um, hook block view, in Drupal 7, you had to give it a delta, right? Because that one hook had to handle every block from your module. In Drupal 8, every block is its own individual class. It has its own uh, specific build method on that class. Uh, so basically, we move from having to know the delta to simply knowing which class corresponds to my block. Um, in Drupal 7, there was really no good way to control access to your blocks. Uh, so you had to hack something maybe into the, to the view hook. Uh, Drupal 8, if you want to, there's a specific method on every block class that allows you to control access to that block. Um, Similarly, in Drupal 7, the way we handle configuration was a little bit like one-off. Uh, so there was hook block configure and hook block save, which again, you had to pass in a delta. And hook block save had a, a array kind of a form values and edit array, but it wasn't a standard form uh, API thing. Instead, in Drupal 8, we have a very standard a form API workflow. So we have the, the method that defines the form, the method that validates the form, and the method that submits the form. So if, if you've you know, used Form API in Drupal 8 for anything, uh, this, this flow here for a block plugin works exactly the same as every other form in Drupal 8. Uh, so I think that's nice. We've got more consistency now in how we're using our APIs. Uh, we've made it easier to control access, and we've made it uh, easier here to validate uh, the configuration for your block. We actually have a validate step, which we didn't have in Drupal 7. OK, so that's the mapping there. Um, so block discovery and annotations, um, each plugin type uh, has to be in the expected uh, namespace. Uh, so this is partly how the block is found, and then it has to use the right annotation. Uh, all the core plugins have a custom annotation class, so that at block annotation actually corresponds to a class I'll show you. Uh, the annotation class provides that documentation about what things are allowed to be in that definition, uh, and provides some default values. And then there's a generic one that you can use basically as a, as a starting point to extend. Uh, so this is what the block annotation class looks like. Um, it extends that plugin annotation, and again, tells you things like the ID and the admin label are valid, valid keys to put in the annotation. All right, so that's what these mean. These, these variables here are the valid keys in the annotation. Okay, so last example um, is filtering text. Uh, we had an info hook in Drupal 7, hook filter info, which would tell you about text filters and how uh, Drupal could, you could build up a text format that would apply different filters to your text. Uh, and this example is taken from project module, not from core. And if you use Drupal.org ever in an issue, you've seen people put an uh, issue number in brackets with a hash sign that links to the issue, right? That's what this text filter does. You see in the info hook, we have the title, the description, uh, and then we have, we're defining callbacks. So the process callback, the tips callback, and then we say whether or not this thing is cacheable. So that's the metadata we get out of the info hook in Drupal 7. We're told, again, the title, description, and then two callbacks and cacheability. 
Uh, in Drupal 8, it works a little bit differently. Um, so we have, again, a plugin. We, if I, so I'm basically implementing, re-implementing the, the uh, project modules functionality in a slightly simpler form in Drupal 8 in this example module. We have an at filter plugin uh, with an ID um, and a title. And then instead of uh, those two callbacks that were functions in Drupal 7, we have methods on the plugin. So we have a process method and a tips method. And those do basically exactly what you think. We get some text passed in to the process method. Uh, we process it and then we return it. So we return it wrapped in this other object called a filter process result. And that's basically serving the same role as that cacheability flag in Drupal 7. So this uh, process result object uh, carries along with it some information about how cacheable uh, this uh, filtered result is. So it might only be cacheable for the current user or it might be cacheable for everyone. In this case, it's just a link to a node. It's the same for everyone. I don't have to provide any special extra cacheability data. But in other cases, you would want to say this is only valid for the current user. Uh, and then the tips uh, method, of course, just returns the filter tips that you see below the text edit area. So if I define this class, again, uh, show you how that works. Uh, so let's say I create a nice uh, first node on my site. Um, node 2058. Um, now I want to enable this new filter plugin. Um, so I go to my text uh, filters in the configure section. I edit, scroll down. I see this title I define in my plugin. Format a node ID as a link. Click that off and save it. Uh, and now if I go and edit my second node, I can basically use this special format, these brackets, hash sign, node ID, uh, to create a link back to my first node. Uh, and you'll see that in the tips below, we're getting just the return value of that tips method showing up in my filter tips. So great, if I save this, it works. Um, I get the node title, I get a link uh, back to my first node, uh, which you can see if I hover over, and that's it. So now this little plugin that just had a, a, you know, a couple methods to implement is able to provide me new filtering functionality for my Drupal site, and I can basically transform text uh, from that sort of token format into an actual link with the title of the node that I care about. Okay, so hopefully that was all informative. Um, a brief pause here for best practices. If you want to define a plugin type for your own module, so this means, for example, you uh, defined an info hook in a module or you defined like a CTools plugin in a Drupal 7 module, define it means you actually called like module invoke all to get the results of all other modules info hooks. Um, so that's something you might convert to a plugin if you upgrade your module to Drupal 8. Uh, my strong advice to you is to use annotation-based discovery uh, by default because it keeps that metadata, that annotation together with the class that's actually doing the work. So you have those two things in the same file. You can basically look at them together uh, and make sure that you understand that the, they, they match up. Um, the YAML discovery, as I mentioned before, is really only good for a few edge cases where the class implementing uh, the plugins is almost always the same. So if 95% of the time the class is going to be the same, no matter what module is implementing the plugin, you might want to use YAML-based discovery. An example of where you might uh, provide a specific class in Drupal 8 is let's say you want a tab in the page that shows the current user's name. So it has to be dynamic, has to be specific for the current user, has to pull in some other information. It's not a fixed string. So that's where you might provide that class uh, name in the YAML file and tell Drupal, I don't want to use the default class, I want to use a specific one that has a different method for the title. But most of the time, you're not going to do that. You're just going to have a fixed string for the title, a fixed link to a, to a route, uh, and you're done. OK. So here's some links um, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, so the sandbox where the code is, uh, handbook pages on converting your modules, if you haven't done that already, another handbook page on the plugin system, and one that I want to highlight specifically, if you want to you know, dive in a little more about the philosophy out why uh, we adopted this plugin system so broadly in Drupal 8. Um, and finally, a blog post from Drupal Eyes Me uh, that covers a lot of the same things this talk does, uh, but from, you know, of course, a slightly different perspective. Uh, so you might find it helpful to compare notes from that blog post to what, what I was telling you today. Um, so let's sort of move to wrapping up. And I want to just, again, give you, you know, a little uh, excitement about using Drupal 8 since it has so many great features. Uh, so widespread uses of interfaces. Everything in Drupal 8 pretty much has an interface. All the plugins, all the plugin managers, almost all the services use an interface. And that means that you can replace them. You can say, I want to use my class instead of the one that was provided by core. As long as you implement the right interfaces, the rest of Drupal doesn't know that you've substituted, you've tricked it, and given it your class instead of the one that it was expecting. Uh, 
in terms of building admin interfaces, you can now group tabs together regardless of what path uh, they're referencing. Um, and that's partly because it's the route name that's the unique thing and not the system path. So we care about those machine names, we don't care about the path. Uh, what's also interesting about that is I can have multiple routes uh, that are possibly serving the same path. And why might you want to do that? So imagine uh, you want to render a node either as HTML or as JSON. Well, it might be at the same path, and I can then append a query string and get a different format. And the query string basically might let Drupal choose between two different routes. So both these routes say, I want to serve the node uh, content, but in one case, if the query string is present, I'm going to go to the route that gives you JSON. In the other case, I'm going to give you HTML. Uh, another example is get and post. So if I do a get request on this particular path, it goes to one route. If I do a post request, it goes to a different route. Uh, so that's really nice. It allows you to segregate out this functionality. Uh, for different cases, that's something that wasn't easy to do in Drupal 7. Uh, again, YAML. I mentioned YAML, YAML, YAML. So if you're not familiar with YAML as a standard for those configuration data files, uh, please uh, take a look at it. Uh, great thing about Drupal 8 is we have multiple instances of the same plugin. The key feature of plugins is reusability. So you can have as many instances of the same block as you want and reuse them anywhere you want on your site. Um, and the way we do that is basically that each block instance has a corresponding config entity that captures that key configuration necessary to instantiate that one block instance. Okay, so to sum it up, um, plugins combine the discovery available functionality with the implementation. Uh, in Drupal 7, that was really the combination of an info hook and multiple other implementation hooks uh, and possibly spread across different files. So in Drupal 7, they were spread out. Uh, you weren't always sure where to look. In Drupal 8, they're actually nicely grouped together, that metadata and the annotation and all the implementation is all in that one class file. Uh, if you're going to define your own plugin type, uh, please do use annotation unless you have a really clear reason to do something else. So um, that's pretty much it. Uh, I'll get to questions in a second. Uh, if you haven't been uh, to DrupalCon Sprint before, I uh, strongly encourage you to stay for Friday. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so there's a half day in the morning of a first time uh, Sprinter workshop. Uh, there are people there that will help you set up. Uh, whether you want to do documentation or code. Uh, if you want to do code, they'll help you get your local development environment set up to, to edit Drupal. Uh, so a great thing to do there. And then all day, there's the mentor core sprint and the general sprint. Uh, so general sprint, you'll find people working on different contributed modules, documentation, marketing initiatives, all kinds of different things. Uh, and the mentor core sprint is people who specifically want to work on Drupal core issues. Uh, and an exciting part of that is at the end of the day, they do one or more uh, live commits of uh, changes people made that day, issues that got all the way from start, not necessarily from start, but got all the way to finish uh, in that day and get committed to Drupal core in, right in front of your eyes. Um, so that's it. Um, please tell me what you think. Please go to the session node 21025 on the site and please fill out the evaluations. That really helps me and helps the conference organizers know whether you appreciated this content, whether you got something useful out of it. Uh, and please also take the DrupalCon uh, Nashville survey to tell them about the overall event. Uh, with that, I uh, would be happy to take your questions. So if your questions, please come to the mic so we get on the recording. Uh, yeah, you, you mentioned that um, you could load a config entity. Uh, yes. Correct. Is there a way to alter it? Is there anything that would allow um, you to change it on the fly? So there is a system, which I'm blanking on now, uh, which you can dynamically alter uh, configuration when it's loaded, yes. Great. Okay. Thank so, you. Yep. Hi. You talked about uh, plugins, being able to use your own plugin to replace another one. Yeah. Is there a way to ensure which plugin, if there are multiple ones in the system, which one wins out and is actually being used? Uh, so th which one wins out, I mean, that's really the same problem as like hook ordering in Drupal 7. So there's not a guaranteed way other than uh, you can uh, make sure that your alter hook is the last one to go if you're worried about that. Um, how, would, how, do, how would you make it sure that it's the last one to go? Uh, so Drupal 8 provides a uh, hook module implements alter hook which allows you to alter the order of in which module hooks are called. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's uh, maybe still a module wait, but I would recommend, yeah, use it. that hook is probably the preferred way to do it.
Hi, uh, great talk. Thanks. But first off, uh, whenever you're working with queue workers, is there a guaranteed way to make sure that the process item method is called? Uh, with queue workers. Yeah, supposedly it's supposed to replace cron, and the job that I'm trying to run is too big for cron to handle, so I've been right. looking into queue workers, and I can make everything work, but I have to manually call process item in the constructor, which I know is just wrong. So I'm trying to figure out a way to make it. Um, yeah, we could talk about that, though. So you might, so it doesn't really replace cron. Often what happens is, um, I don't know if you defined the cron uh, key in, in the annotation for your key worker. Yeah, I did. You did, OK. So that should get called on cron then. Um, uh, I mean, that's, I've had it work. But yeah, generally, you just break up those, those jobs into smaller chunks and put them in the queue. And when cron runs, it should call them. Yeah. Well, do, do I have to uh, implement hook cron for that to ever fire? Uh, your module should not have to implement hook cron, if you, as long as you define that key in the annotation. The key okay. worker. Well, I'll dig into it yeah. some more. Thank you, though. Yeah, sure. It's a full great talk. Thanks. Uh, my question is regarding uh, YML files. Okay. Uh, Sometimes you have to um, basically, I was uh, doing a content uh, import, so I have basically a few different um, environments. So for if it's a dev environment, get it from here. If it's a staging environment, get it. <laughs> from this URL. So how you can change the URL in uh, YML depending on your uh, environment dynamically? Hmm. So did you go to Dries' keynote today? Uh, yeah. OK. So that was one of the things he highlighted as a problem, yeah. is uh, altering those. So there's a f few different strategies. I mean, so one thing is you can, I mean, Drupal does ship with a system for altering config dynamically. And that's, for example, how uh, translations of configuration happen. Um, is that dynamic altering? Uh, but that's a little bit tricky. There are a couple modules uh, that will let you basically substitute in uh, different pieces of configuration. Mm. Uh, it's, I would say it's not a well-solved problem, unfortunately, which is why it was in the okay. keynote. <laughs> okay. OK, so it is a problem. It's, it, it is a problem, okay. yeah. So yeah, I, substituting those values in, in yeah, those different yeah, environments. I kind of figured out. I yeah. couldn't find anything on. Uh, yeah, so I mean, you can override config values in settings PHP, so that's yeah, uh, how we've been doing it. That's the only way to right. uh, basically write some script which will, when uh, on Acquia post deploy, um, hooks to directly alter your uh, config. Yeah, I mean, there are, there, again, there are hooks that will allow you to, to swap things out in config um, at, at runtime, so okay. it is possible to do it in a module, but it's, it, it's, yeah, it's not beautiful at this point. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Uh, hi. Great hi. talk, by the way. Thanks. Um, after you showed your routing YAML file, yeah. uh, you showed the defaults uh, property to uh, show what properties you could use in that YAML file. Right. Th um, that was for the, the local task plugins. Right. OK. okay. Yeah. Now, is there a way to see this, the sub-properties, like the, uh, the ones that begin with the underscore, like an easy way to find those? Oh, so th that, those, that's the routing definition. So that's uh, where I'd say look at the starting point would be to look at the Symfony documentation. Um, I mean, I think there's some Drupal org ones also. But if you start basically the Symfony ones, most of those are fairly standard. Um, Drupal has kind of repurposed a couple of them, uh, so things like where uh, a route is a form instead of just a controller. Um, it uses like underscore form, things like that. Um, okay. All right. So a lot of those come from Symfony now. But a lot of them come from Symfony. Uh, so that's kind of, if you just want to get an overview of what goes in there, I'd, I'd start with the Symfony right. docs. Great. Thanks yeah. a lot. Hi. Thank you for the talk. Um, I had a question about <clears throat> the annotations. You said you could uh, locate the definitions of the annotations. Where, where does that live? Um, so those, those are classes themselves. So they're annotation classes. Uh -huh. uh, and the class name is basically the same as that annotation. So at block uh, basically says the, the, there's a block annotation class. That's actually the name of the class. So you basically just look for a class name block that was under the annotation namespace of, in this case, Drupal core or under some module. Ah, uh, OK. Um, and then an, uh, another question on the, on the routing. Um, in Symfony uh, console, there was a 
there's a command that you can show your routes, uh, mm -hmm. router debug show right. controllers. Is there is there something corresponding in Drupal 8 so you can tie routes to controllers? Uh, so the Drupal console does have basically a, an equivalent command. So we'll list all the um, routes, and then you can dive into specific routes to see the controllers. So the Drupal console, which basically wraps Symphony console and some other things. Ah, OK. All right, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. OK, any other questions? If not, thank you. And uh, again, please fill out the evaluations. Uh, I remember your name. I don't remember the specific question. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 